Yeah, thank you, Howie. Uh, hello, thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Jacobson, and I serve as the commissioner of the state's Department of Public Safety. First, first, let me offer my sincerest condolences to the family of Mr. Cobb. The Cobb family has experienced an immense, an immense loss and tragedy. Anytime a loved one is no longer with us, it's incredibly difficult and shocking. But today I'm here with Colonel Langer to share the video of this incident. I will also reiterate that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Force Investigations Unit is working to gather the facts of this incident and it is a top priority, but it will take time. As is their usual process, once they complete their initial investigation, they will release additional details about this incident, including the names of the people involved, a more detailed description of the incident and how it unfolded, and any evidence recovered at the scene. So more information will be released by the end of the week by the BCA. But today, we will share video with the public. I now turn to Colonel Matt Langer, the Chief of the State Patrol, for a few remarks before we share that video. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Matt Langer. I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief Colonel of the Minnesota State Patrol. Um, a lot has transpired in the past couple of days, and uh, one of my opening remarks to echo the sentiment from the Commissioner is uh, when I think about everything that I've seen and been through in the past couple of days, in my job, um, the one way that I would classify it is this is just a, a tremendously sad situation. It's sad from every perspective and for everyone involved. The State Patrol is committed to doing our very best to be responsive and transparent, while also honoring the investigative process. Uh, as you probably noticed yesterday, we committed to releasing the body-worn camera video as rapidly as we could, but only after the family was allowed an opportunity to view it first, which is exactly what the commissioner and I spent this afternoon doing. We'll be showing you a video of the incident, squad and body-worn camera, along with one still photo, and I'll offer a few facts of the case that we can release today. Please remember this is still an open and active investigation and many of the answers we simply don't have yet. And the Minnesota State Patrol is not the investigating agency. So questions about the investigation are not things that I'm aware of. I'll do my best to answer questions, and it's my spirit generally in a news conference to be very helpful. And I'm um, predicting today there will be an awful lot of I can't talk about that. I don't know. It's part of the investigation. I don't have the answer. Here's what I can tell you about the incident. Just before 1.50 a.m. early Monday morning, a state patrol trooper was monitoring traffic coming out of downtown on Interstate 94. That would be a normal practice for our troopers who work overnight hours in their search for impaired drivers and, and uh, watching for traffic violations. While observing traffic, the trooper saw a Ford Fusion without any taillights on, traveling northbound on Interstate 94 near Lowry Avenue, Minneapolis. The trooper pulled this vehicle over, and during the course of that investigation, that traffic stop, troopers learned that the driver was actually wanted by law enforcement in Ramsey County in connection with a felony order for protection violation. That certainly prolonged the interaction roadside as the troopers worked, to validate and confirm that that want on this individual was still in effect and that they had the right person. As they worked to detain the driver to get him out of the vehicle, the driver refused to exit. Troopers were attempting to remove the driver from the vehicle verbally and then moved in as he drove away. A state patrol trooper discharged their firearm during the course of this incident. Life-saving measures were immediately provided by the troopers until emergency services arrived. Three state patrol troopers were placed on administrative leave, which is normal and part of state patrol policy. We're going to start uh, by showing a still image of the vehicle that went by the trooper. Um, just so you can see, I think it's important to show this. Is, this was the first image, that uh, a still image from the video that, that depicts what the trooper saw as the vehicle went by. Um, as we move into the four videos that I'm going to show, I want to preface that to say, I'm not going to talk during the videos. I'm not going to narrate. Uh, I think it's my belief that the videos should play on their own and people should develop their own thoughts about the video rather than be perceived or being trying to inject 
some sort of narrative over the top of the videos. So um, I'll let the videos play. The commissioner and I can stand for any questions and answer those that we can for a while here. There's three body-worn camera videos that you'll see, and then there's one squad video that we're prepared to also show today. Uh, the first video is the trooper's body-worn camera behind the driver's side of the vehicle that was pulled over. I ask that that plays.
stop that video the sequence is the same they pull um, the individual out and, and try life-saving efforts the fourth and final video we're prepared to show today is uh, one of the troopers their squad dash video their dash camera so it provides a little more context versus the body worn cameras not to get into the technology but the audio follows the camera so in this case the audio is obviously different because the squad it's coming from the squad camera which is you know at a different location than the body worn camera so but this video also
from this standpoint. They really begin to render aid as soon as they possibly can. Um, uh, it goes without saying, but you know, for really difficult videos to watch, I've seen them a number of times. It, it doesn't get any easier at all. Um, as someone who cares about other human beings and has the job that I do, it's uh, not easy. Difficult is an understatement. That said, I, I mentioned I won't be able to answer a ton of questions, particularly those about the investigation, but both the commissioner and I are, are willing to do what we can for a while here to help answer questions you have uh, in the immediate aftermath of viewing the video. Uh, Jeff, what happened to the assistant reporter? It seems, um, so I'm trying to understand, is this standard operating procedure for your tutors to ask people to work when it's a warrant's two-step out of the vehicle? Why didn't you hear tutors just come up with what you were wanted for um, and allow them to remain Yeah, there's different ways to look at that issue, but um, when I witness or observe the conduct of the troopers and the conversation they're having, I wouldn't say it's out of the or ordinary for their interactions with people. They simply asked him to get out of the car, and they had lawful reason to do so. Right, but why can't the troopers just tell them what the reason was for, um, like, and allow him to remain in the vehicle? Yeah, no, it's, it's a question that certainly will come out as part of the investigation. I haven't visited with the troopers about what they were thinking or why they did what they did, so I can't speak to the, what they were thinking. Jeff, we're on the WCCL. Um, it's hard to tell where the shot came from. Can you tell us which camera or which trooper had the shot? Yeah, I want to be careful not to get into the investigative side, but the video of the trooper who fired rounds is the one who was at the passenger side. Uh, Brittany, on the camera side, how many times was the shot? I don't have that confirmed, sorry. Was he armed? Another question for the BCA as part of their investigation. Just real quickly, folks, this is a reminder, and we, as I mentioned a couple of different times, there's an independent investigation going on. Uh, a lot of the questions that you guys have, we have those same questions. If we continue to get into the questions, and it's not out of disrespect or anything, I used to be a reporter and understand the need for these questions to be asked, but there are questions that will be answered by the investigation. If, if uh, I just don't want to have the colonel or commissioner saying we can't answer that because of the investigation for the next several months. You mentioned the, just a little review from Carolyn, uh, the reason that they wanted to take him out was because of this uh, domestic abuse uh, violation. But was it a warrant or can you just kind of clarify what this was exactly? Yeah, so, and I should have repeated the question for those that are online, I'm sorry. So the question is about was this a warrant or not? It was not a warrant. It was a pickup and hold for a felony order for protection violation that originated from the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office. And then, so just to follow up on that, is that something that would appear like on the computer that tells that from the trooper's point of view? The question relates to how does the trooper become aware of that information? Uh, it, it absolutely does come back. So in the event that a driver who's the registered owner has that pick up and hold when the trooper runs their license plate, part of the information that comes back would include that information. Um, similar to a warrant, but unique because it's uh, different than a warrant, is the need to confirm that pick up and hold with the originating agency. And so that was part of what the troopers were doing that took some time with the traffic stop before we showed the deadly force encounter here. Uh, but that's exactly what they did is confirm that this is still an active pickup and hold that the agency who desires this individual to be brought into custody still believes they have probable cause uh, and that it is the correct person that's the reference to ramsey county that they made exactly yep, the, the question is is that the reference to ramsey county yes that's where this pickup and hold originated from was the ramsey county sheriff's office so their confirmation would go back to that originating agency that's epic Why don't we hear the gunshots on the body camera so we can hear them um, as well? The question is uh, a very good one. Why don't we hear the gunshots on the body-worn camera? Uh, I don't have an answer for you on that. We are equally per perplexed. Um, I suspect, and I'm speculating, that technicians or the technical engineers at Axon would be better to answer that question. Um, we live in a world where we watch a video and we see it and we hear it and then we think, yep, that's what happened. And for me in this case, it just gives me pause to say, why don't we hear the gunshots on the body-worn camera, but yet we hear them very clearly on the squad video. So part of the BCA's investigation will surely, based on evidence and all the work that they do, try to line up everything down to a fraction of a second. But um, 
one of the body worn cameras in particular, oddly, it doesn't record the gunshots, even though it's recording all of the other ambient noise. One of the other body worn cameras captures what I, I, would, ca I would categorize as a subdued gunshot. And then the squad video with the window down clearly captures gunshots. So that was something that we were initially perplexed by, and we still are. Yeah, I'll, I'll let the commissioner answer that, and I'm happy to also answer. Uh, yeah, and just to repeat the question, I think in, in essence is that the BCA is uh, part of a, a state agency, part of the Department of Public Safety. The Minnesota State Patrol is also a part of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Um, how would an investigative process work between those two agencies and, and does that create public trust? Um, I, I will uh, uh, let you know that obviously the Minnesota State Patrol and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension are separate law enforcement agencies. They act independently, they do independent work. They both have their chief law enforcement officers, Colonel Matthew Langer, who is here today, and, and Superintendent Drew Evans, uh, who is with the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. So they both have their law enforcement agencies and their duties. Um, anytime that there is an officer-involved shooting in the state of Minnesota, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension typically is uh, asked to perform those investigations. We have a specific unit within the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the Force Investigation Unit which has been supported and funded through direct legislative priorities to go ahead and to be the go-to agency for law enforcement, officer-involved shootings or use of force shootings or in custody deaths. Uh, that has worked very well for a number of years. In fact, it was just recently funded uh, for in the legislature to continue with that force investigation unit. Um, through the creation of that process, I mean, this scenario was contemplated and through that work, uh, this is just the way that was contemplated that it would occur, that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the Force Investigative Unit, which does not train with or have regular contact with any other law enforcement agencies, including the State Patrol, would conduct those investigations. Uh, it will be separate and independent from the Minnesota State Patrol. And as mentioned today, you know, my time spending, spent with Colonel Langer is really specific to spending time with the family and walking through the video with you. Um, when I spend time with Superintendent Evans, that will be updates with the investigative process, but they are an independent process, independent uh, agency, um, and I don't provide direction and control. They do their investigation, get the final product, and then when that final product is completed, there's full transparency. It's available to the public. It will go to the county attorney's office. In this case, it would be Mary Moriarty of the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. Um, so again, we, we think that that process worked and, and does work, and we've done that several times. So Marlo, we'll start with you and Matt, this is a question for you. Um, you had a shot fired and it hit. Can you just talk a little bit about what is the procedure or protocol that this rise to a use of force level based on the standards and other control? Yeah, the question is how it relates to the use of force level for the State Patrol. Um, for sure. So we have very clear policies all available on our website. Uh, this very clearly meets the threshold of the use of deadly force. Um, and so that triggers protocols within the organization, including a critical incident review uh, downstream where we take a look at this incident from beginning to end to uncover any answers that we might want to come uh, forward with related to training, related to equipment, related to supervisory notification, related to protocol. Um, our goal is for these things to never happen. And so when they do happen, we shift really quickly into why did it happen and is there absolutely anything we can do in the future to make sure it doesn't happen again? So that critical incident review process is part of the puzzle of trying to determine that and that augments the incredibly anticipated um, investigation from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension too, that once things are done also helps us to make decisions internally about what if anything should change. We'll take one more. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that statement. When you said meets the threshold of use of deadly force, what, is, what did you mean by that? Well, the question is what I meant by the, the answer to the uh, meet the threshold of the use of deadly force, but firing um, a service weapon in the direction of another human being is very clearly the use of deadly force. So for us, that would trigger that standard within our policy and protocol. I apologize if I didn't answer the question that you were asking, but that's how I interpreted it. Can you say at what point the threshold was met that we saw in the video? 
Yeah, that is way too deep into the investigation and what the individual troopers were thinking, and I, I simply don't know what they were thinking. Thanks, guys. I was thinking Thanks. of training your officers to be escalated situations like this.